what I had observed as church, for the most part, that was not happening in the local churches. People did not understand the one another commands. People were not living to fulfill the one another commands. And therefore, the body of Christ was suffering and does suffer. So we're going to hit some of them today, just a few of them. Our scripture reading had a bunch of them this morning. But uh, sometimes as we look at these and we start evaluating how can I actually live out these things in my life, we find that we really need to start evaluating the way we do life and the way we do church. Things have to be adjusted. Because the American way of doing things and having things that are mine is comfortable for us, but it may be not what God is calling us to do. Might need to lock the door so nobody tries to get out as we look at some of these. Verse 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Don't lose hope, the end is near. The end of all things it has. Peter's just finished speaking of judgment back there in verses 5 and 6. He says, they will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. See, this word end, telos in the Greek, does not necessarily indicate cessation or termination or a chronological conclusion. Rather, it means consummation, fulfillment, and purpose attained or a goal achieved. In this context, it's referring to Christ's return. His second coming. The end in view, then, is not the consummation of persecution for Peter's readers, they're not finally getting the freedom. Neither did the apostle have in mind an imminent change in the government that would result in more benevolent treatment of the believers. His rest reference is the fulfillment of all things, the plan that God has put in place, and that indicates he's speaking of the Lord's return, as he does many places in Scripture. See, Peter had the same understanding as the Apostle Paul and the, and the Apostle John. They were expecting Christ's return at any time. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul said, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Revelation 22, 20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. So Peter's looking at an imminent return of Jesus Christ. Are we looking for Jesus Christ to return? We may be going through difficult things, maybe with your kids, maybe with cancer, maybe with your boss. Think, how am I going to get through? Look to the future. Jesus is coming. This is short term. Eternity is forever. And because the end is at hand, Jesus is coming soon. Therefore, we as believers have hope. Don't confuse this idea of the end of all things being at him, that we die, the world is destroyed, and there is no more. See, there's people out there that say, hey, when, death, when I die, that's it, I'm done. Live as you want to live, and whoo, it's over. Scripture doesn't tell us that. Now, Scripture teaches us that our spirits are forever. We will either be risen to eternal life with God or eternal life, eternal death and punishment in the lake of hell, lake of fire, also referred to as hell. So the end of all things is the consummation of this age. 
Jesus Christ returning for his own, returning to take back the earth since he is a rightful owner. As believers who are watching their brothers and sisters in Christ lose their property, livelihood, and their lives, the return of Jesus Christ was an awesome prospect. There's hope. See, much of our culture today, when somebody puts their faith in Jesus Christ, much of our culture say, oh, good for you. They might hassle us. You're really going to give your money to that church, and you're going to give up your Sundays fishing and hunting and playing Xbox or whatever you're doing with your waste your time? But it wasn't like in their day when they made a commitment to Jesus Christ, were publicly baptized, and it may cost them their home, it may cost them their job, and it may cost them all their relatives. It might mean that the people on their street now turn against them. Not just ignoring them as they drive by, but actually are out to get them physically. See, sometimes we we lose sight of that. So the hope of Jesus' return was a great encouragement to them. And as believers who were watching their brothers and sisters in Christ lose their property, their livelihood, and their lives, the return of Jesus Christ was such an encouragement. Some of the Thessalonian folks, though, when they heard that Jesus was coming, they quit all their work. And they went and waited for God to come back. They, too, were rebuked. Paul says, if they won't work, don't feed them. Why weren't they working? They're waiting for Jesus. He's coming any time. I don't need to go to work. Folks, we go to work and we expect Jesus to return. So we want our friends and family to know that if they don't know Christ, they're going to a Christless eternity. But it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next year. But we live with the imminent view that Jesus is coming back. And whatever I'm going through, it's worth it because glory's to come. He wants me to serve till Jesus comes. He wants us to live our lives first in fellowship with him, then in fellowship and ministry to others. Why do I say in fellowship to him? Look at the verse, rest of verse 7. It says, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Serious and watchful. Now, sometimes when they translate from the Greek to the English, a word may be so full of meaning that it's hard to get in one word. And these are two of those words. It's interesting, and I think I put it on the PowerPoint here. Uh, The term serious and watchful, when it's translated into the ESV, says self-controlled and sober-minded. In the New Living Translation, it's earnest and disciplined. In the NIV, it's clear-minded and self-controlled. In ASB, it's sound judgment and sober spirit. HCSB is serious and disciplined. So this is a big change of how we are to be thinking And these words include a lot. A definition of this word serious is to think and live wisely in self-control over one's passions and desires. So I am going to rein in the flesh. Second term there, be watchful or sober-minded, as some of the translations say, is to curb the controlling influences of the inordinate emotions and desires and therefore become reasonable. It's also dealing with conceived of sobering from the influence of alcohol. So the watchful and the sober-minded individual not only puts away alcohol, but is in the state of mind to avoid what Paul has just said the Gentiles are guilty of back in verses 3 and 4. Remember this last week? It says we've spent enough time in the past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles. We walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries, In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. We have a different way of thinking now than we're in Jesus Christ. And this thinking brings us into fellowship with God as we submit to his word. It's a change from 
a worldly desire, a philosophy of living for myself, to Colossians 3 puts it this way, of setting my mind on spiritual things. It says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Where's my focus? Is my focus in living to make me happy, or is my focus in heaven living to honor and glorify God? When the Holy Spirit changes me because I put my faith in Jesus Christ, these things are changed in my way of thinking, and it affects my actions. And not only does it affect my actions, according to this passage in verse 7, it says, be serious and watchful in your prayers. It's going to affect our prayer. See, this fellowship with God and removal of self from sin in the world is necessary for our prayer lives to be effective. When my mind is focused on living for Christ with eternity in view, I can live as he desires me to live with the help of the Holy Spirit. It continue, if I continue to live in a self-indulgent, self-focused life that's influenced by Satan and his philosophy, I'll find that I'm not interested in what God has for me. If we allow the pursuits of the world to be at the forefront of our thinking and our passions and our prayer lives, it's going to be hindered to non-existent. I don't need God's help to live in the flesh. I need God's help to love these people who are hard to love. I need God's help to share the gospel with people who don't want to hear the gospel. Prayer is the access to all our spiritual resources. But believers can't pay pro- pra- can't pray properly if their minds are unstable due to worldly pursuits, due to ignorance of divine truth or indifference to divine purposes. See, I can pray for what I want, but do I know what God's desire for people is? Man's desire and God's purposes do not always line up. Saints who seriously study the scripture and discover its profound truths about God experience rich communion with him. And understanding what Paul called the mind of Christ. Is my mind thinking as Christ would think? We saw the importance of our thinking last week. It continues on here as we control our thoughts, our desires, and emotions so that we can honor the Lord and have an effective prayer life. It affects our fellowship with Him. So we want to not lose hope, but at the same time, we want to live our lives in close fellowship with God And as we live with the end in view, we walk in fellowship with God, it's going to affect the way we interact with believers in Jesus Christ. And that's what he gets into in the rest of these verses. In verse 8 he says, Above all things, love. See, love within the relationship between believers is a priority. In fact, Jesus said, people will know you were my disciples because of your love for one another, right? And it's interesting that a primary reason we're given in the scriptures in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, a primary reason to gather is to provoke one another Glad the verse doesn't start there because I've met some churches who are really good at that. But it says, provoke one another to love and good works. We are supposed to be poking and prodding one another to be better lovers and better servers. Right? Provoke one another to love and good works. And he goes on, he says, above all, In verse 8, above all things, have fervent love for one another. Fervent love is loving earnestly. 
Loving earnestly carries the idea of extending with effort. This word translated earnestly is also the same word when it talks about Peter reaching out his hand to preach. It deals with effort and extension. The idea of fervency is used in some writing, carried the idea that a runner is giving his all as he runs the race, where all the muscles of his entire body are engaged in this process. It's used of a racehorse running full tilt down the track as its whole body is engaged. So it's easy to come to church and say, oh, I love you guys. But when is the last time we would be guilty of fervently loving people to where we are fully engaged as a runner or a racehorse in the way we love? We have an example of Christ's love in that way. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his own love toward us, and now while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Fully engaged to the point of death that we might have eternal life. See, we must choose to love one another, putting effort into loving our brother and sisters in Christ and helping them to grow in their faith. And as they grow through the trials of life, such love is sacrificial, not sentimental. And it requires stretching of believers every spiritual muscle to love in spite of insult, in spite of injury, and in spite of misunderstanding from others. This requires interaction and it requires access. I can't be loving people that I am not interacting with. I can't love on people who won't let me love on them. If they say, well, you stay over there. I'm staying inside my home and shutting the doors. I don't want you to love on me. See, we have to have access. We have to have interaction. And one can complain that no one cares about them or no one spends time to them. But it's interesting that most of the time I hear this, the individual has not made it a point to be regular in attendance to church, to Sunday school, to small group, to Wednesday night Bible study. They're isolating themselves from the love that could be displayed to them through interaction and access. See, it's giving us access to our lives that allows us to get to know one another, one another's needs, and allows us to better minister to one another. I'm afraid that many avoid this type of relation in the church for one of two reasons. One, they don't want to put the effort into loving somebody else. Or two, they're afraid of accountability and the challenge to be living right before God that will come with it. If your mom cooked you supper every night and had it ready for you to eat and you chose not to come eat, could you say she was being unloving? Isn't your pastor and your Sunday school teachers laying out a meal for you every week, whether you come or not, love is being demonstrated? Do your minds work that way? Not only do we have to have interaction and access to, to have this fervent love, but when that love is taking place, love covers a multitude of sins. And this is certainly true when one in love puts their faith in Christ and finds forgiveness through him. God's love in Christ removes the guilt of our sin before God and begins to transform us in all our actions. It also allows us to acknowledge and make things right with those we've wronged but it goes beyond that in my love there are times that I choose to overlook being sinned against perhaps it's an unusual incident in their life 
a snap of the tongue that is out of character for them, an unkind word. Now, we, we can choose to allow love to cover if some circumstances are met. One, I can do this if in love they can allow it to be covered and don't spend time bringing it up to themselves or bringing it up to other people. I can say, well, I'm, not, I'm just going to let love cover that. And then for the next three weeks, all you think about is what that person said to you. And the next time you see someone else, you're telling them about it. You're venting. That's not letting love cover. That's gossip. They can do it also. They can let love cover if they're able to keep it from affecting their present and future relationship. If I say, I'm going to let love cover it, but I'm not going to talk to them the next month, that's not letting love cover it. We can let love cover it if one can do this if it's not a habitual sin in their life that's preventing them from having close fellowship with God or other believers. Often, these things are habitual in people's lives. And it hurts their testimony. It hurts multiple relationships. And we need to be willing to speak up. If it's not affecting their testimony of Christ to others, then it's not public. How can I illustrate this? Is this working, Lance, if I could get off? There, thank you. Can you stand up, Benny? Can I pick on you? Imagine with me, Benny pulled an all-nighter throwing boxes at Publix. He's tired. He's got the sniffles, doesn't feel well. I say something to him, and he snaps back, you are so idiotic. How do you ever, and whatever, he goes off. I have a choice. I can just blow him back, blow back at him. I may be, though, like, what? In shock, because that is out of character for Vinny. He doesn't have that habit in his life. And I realized, man, he just worked for 18 hours doing a double, working overnight. He's tired. He's got the sniffles. He's grumpy. I can say, Vinny, I love you, and I never bring it back to my mind. I never bring it up to anyone else, but I allow love to cover that in his life. Thank you, Ben. And he's never done that, by the way. But true love will allow love to cover a multitude of sins. It's going to share the gospel so that people's sin can be covered through the love of Jesus Christ. But as we go on, this gets even more personal. As we're to have close fellowship with God, we're living to serve to the end. It says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. What's it mean to be hospitable? Being hospitable. The term itself means a lover of strangers. Lover of strangers. Do we love strangers? This takes our love outside the walls of the church to people we do not know, to other believers. Hebrews 13, 2 reminds us that there have been some who have entertained angels unaware. You read back the Old Testament, they, they show up, they feed them a barbecue and realize they're angels later. According to the Mosaic Law, the Jews were to expend, extend a hospitality to foreigners, to strangers. Jesus commended believers who provided food, clothing, and shelter to others. Certainly, we can include this in this idea of hospitality, offering a meal and a place to stay. See, in their day, a Holiday Inn was not a thing. Holiday Inns didn't flourish. They didn't live within three miles of 15 motels. And then there were those who were being persecuted, run from their homes and job, who needed a home. 
So what if we extend hospitality from just having people over after church to the orphan and the widow? Have you looked at the cost of renting a one-bedroom apartment in Lakeland? If we were to take a survey of our congregation, how many empty bedrooms do you think we would find? When I say an empty bedroom, I'm talking about a room that's designed to be a bedroom. In Illinois, the law was if it had a window and a closet and it was a room, it, was consider, it would be considered a bedroom. It wasn't technically a bedroom for taxation without a closet. So this would be your she sheds, your man caves, your, your offices, your guest room that's a guest room that once every couple of years, great grandma shows up in or something. Let's take that survey. Raise your fingers of how many of you have extra bedrooms or rooms in your home. Five of them? Two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Wow, we're we're up approaching thirty bedrooms. Wow. Often at our supper table, Landon or Logan will say, can we talk about the elephant in the room? Because one of them hung a a, a necklace elephant up by the ceiling. But it's an election year. Can we talk about the elephants in the room? You elephants do not like the idea of the government giving away money to the less fortunate to help them get by. But how often do we expect the government to pay for the housing for our single widows in our congregation? Have we ever taken this hospitality idea that far? You will allow the government to pay for the housing for a brother or sister in Christ who may have spent their life working underpaid in Christian ministry and you let the government pay for it. Because we need our man caves. See, we say we tithe because everything we have is God's and I'm being a steward. And I believe that, that's true. Is this one back on now? But how willing am I to offer hospitality? We say fervent love is pictured as the muscles of love are being stretched and engaged. Rob and Janine, if you start filling empty bedrooms with orphans or homeless, does it stretch the muscles of love? What's that? stretching bedrooms see I ask about empty bedrooms I didn't ask how many of you have put two to four people in your bedrooms what if we extend this to other believers who lost their jobs or dislocated from their homes it was happening there because of persecution sometimes it's going to happen because of the economy or a virus which affects the economy what about immigrants seeking asylum from corruption and afflictions they're facing we've spent thousands of dollars over the last year and a half sending boxes of groceries and clothing and shoes and medical supplies to Venezuela it's a necessary thing But what if Carlos and Dan Arce said, I've got 15 people that are leaving Venezuela from our church, brothers and sisters in Christ, and they need a place to live. How important would our man caves be?
Isn't that hospitality, loving the stranger? Are you going to be stretched? You betcha. Are you going to be blessed? Absolutely. Now, some of you are out there, I told you we need to lock the doors. Some of you are out there saying, Pastor, you're absolutely crazy. Am I? Flip in your Bibles over to Acts chapter 4, verse 32. If you don't have your Bible, look on the board. I encourage you to bring your Bible. You need to know where things are at in our scripture. It helps us. But Acts 4, 32, when the church was young, when persecution was growing, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of these things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostle gave witness to the resurrection of the, Holy, of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as his need. I didn't even challenge you to sell your houses. I challenge you to open the door and pull down the covers. Leave a light on for them, right? Hey, do we put Motel 6 out of business? At least for Christian brothers and sisters? But notice the condition that goes with this. Be hospitable without what? Grumbling. No complaining. That's also hard, isn't it, Rob and Janine? You ate my Twinkie. I've had that Polish sausage in the fridge waiting to come home to it. People eat. But that's my favorite chair you're sitting in. See, when we start applying these principles we say we believe in, and we say that this is a guide for life, is it going to start affecting us in different ways? What happened to my peace and quiet? He's laughing. It comes between 1 and 5 in the morning, doesn't it? But what is grumbling? I, I would like you all just to help me out for a minute. And just all of you say over and over, grumble, 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 grumble. It's one of those words with onomatopoeia, isn't it? You have to ask our teachers what that word means later. But it sounds like what it is. We give, we're given the opportunity by God to bless others and we complain about it. You invited 15 people over for supper? Are you out of your mind? You know, how often do we complain? But we're to be hospitable without grumbling and complaining. Let me encourage you, start having people for meals or snacks or dessert or just prayer. I put an article on the internet this week about not putting so much effort into making things perfect to be hospitable, but just opening your home. Showing love and concern. Pray about what God would have you do with that extra bedroom. The next command here, after be hospitable, it says, let each one of us, verse 10, as every one of us received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him minister, do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So each of us needs to take the gift that God has individually given to us, and as good stewards, we use that to minister in other people's lives. A lot of people, I hear them talk about where they're going to go to church. And and their main concern is, what am I going to get out of worship? Their concern is not, how is God going to use me in the life of my brothers and sisters in Christ? How does he want me to fulfill these one another commands? There's a couple passages that have lists of gifts of the Spirit. That's what this gift is talking about. And sometimes people want to give these tests and say, take this test and you know what your gift is. My philosophy is serve God while you, where you're at, and as God uses you to bless others, your spiritual gifts are revealed. It's not sit back and wait. It's not hit this checklist because Each of us, as we look at our lives, probably don't meet any of those 100%. Oh, I can preach, I can teach a little, I I can help people, I can love on people, I can exhort people, encourage people. Where, Where am I at? But if my concern is, what's in it for me with them, for those of you liking that, acronyms, work on that with them. I'm getting it out of your vocabulary. If my focus is what's in it for me, then I've come with the wrong focus. If you've got a speaking gift, speak with the strength God gives so that God is glorified through Christ. If it's a ministering or helping gift, do it through God's strength. Now, if I'm going to minister through God's strength, doesn't that imply that I'm going beyond my physical capabilities? It's interesting how often you hear, well, I have to take me time. Got to take care of me before I can do it. I don't see that in Scripture. I see get into God's Word, get in close relationship with Him, and rely on Him to empower you in ministry. I got a text this week at 3 in the morning. You know why? Because Pat's out loving on people and extending and exerting her love like a racehorse. How many more of us need to be doing similar things? As we wrap this up and we try to bring this, we have to remember the end is at hand. Am I ready to meet my maker? Have I put my faith in Christ who paid the penalty of sin on the cross that I might have eternal life with God? That's why Jesus came and paid the penalty of sin for us so we might have life. And if you've never put your faith in Christ, I beg you to do so. For those of you who put your faith in Christ, am I living as if the end is near? And am I giving my time, my talent, my treasures to minister to others so God is glorified? If someone were to evaluate my love, is it being stretched and fully engaged? Do I look like the sprinter? Or does my love look like the guy who's still in his recliner watching from the sidelines? I 
I want to help others understand that they need their sins forgiven to live a new life. As I lovingly walk beside those who are not perfect, and at times they're going to sin against me. And how does my life demonstrate love for strangers? How do we do it accepting and engaging visitors at church? Hey, you're in my chair. I see a stake in your claims this week, but we didn't hear news. So everybody's out getting their chair back. So there was none of that this week. But. Do I accept people in my home temporarily? Missionary for the weekend? How about a long-term basis? Am I using my gifts to serve others for God's glory and not my own? Where are we at? I encourage some of you to start evaluating. Be serious and watchful in your prayers as you evaluate, am I loving and serving the Lord with my life? Do the people around me understand and see my love to them because of the effort I'm putting in? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come today recognizing that you give us some pretty strong, difficult things. You challenge us to be unselfish in the things we do. You challenge us to love to the point of straining. You challenge us to serve to the point that we have to rely upon your power. And I'm afraid as I evaluate this myself that there's times that I can grumble about hospitality. There's times that I can give up too soon and want to so focus on self and ask for forgiveness. We pray that you would help each of us to evaluate these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we close out the service, uh, let's say March's memory verse together. 1 Peter 4, verses 8 through 10. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover the multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10. As the men come forward this morning for the offering, I encourage you to just be praying. Uh, a lot of people battling sickness, flu, there's different sicknesses going around. Those who are recovering from, from surgery, think of Linda, um, Judy with an upcoming surgery. Um, just be praying for them. That God will work in their lives, heal and strengthen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for uh, this service this morning. Thank you for Pastor Larry faithfully presenting your word, presenting truth, uh, that we may apply it and be able to share with others. And so, Father, I pray um, as we uh, think of those in the church who are sick, battling different sicknesses and surgeries and uh, recovering, and Father, I pray you would give grace, you would give strength, comfort where it's needed. Pray for those who have upcoming surgeries. Um, you would be with them. Father, be with this, the doctors, be with the surgeons. Father, I pray that... Um, as we learned this morning, just being hospitable to those around us, I pray as we go into this dark world that we will be faithful in sharing the gospel, proclaiming this good news to those around us. And we thank you that uh, you give us the privilege of, um, of doing that, being able to share this good news. And so, Father, I pray we would do just that. I pray for this offering we're about to receive, that we'd use it for the furtherance of the gospel here and to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Sunday school teachers, I would encourage you. Uh, what we've been doing for the senior high boys is, is I've been choosing a senior high boy every morning on Sunday to uh, present the gospel, to practice. Because if, if we don't practice here and we're not practicing out there, we're going to be too scared to, to go and talk to someone. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've been having the boys uh, every week so far for the past month um, practice sharing the gospel with one another, having those gospel conversations. Uh, so if it doesn't start here, where are we going to start? Uh, if you would please stand with us as we sing the servant song. and others. Appreciate you coming today. I encourage you to be out for small group. You should have plenty to discuss tonight. Uh, as I warned the little leaders yesterday of that. But uh, we want to also take the time to welcome any first-time visitors or first time in a long time, and I'd love the chance to meet with you. If you'll take a couple minutes and meet me over here in just a minute or two by these tables there, the cafe area. We've got a special gift. To thank you for being with us and love the chance to greet you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your word. Father, help us not to take it lightly, but to evaluate how we stand before you in light of your word. Help us to recognize we need to love one another more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 